and welcome back to Cultural Geography. So I'll be making video lectures to accompany the chapters in your textbook. This video is going to highlight the concept of white flight, but it's also your responsibility for the materials covered in your textbook, as you'll be tested on this as well. So in this video lecture, I will briefly introduce the story of the Great Migration, but we'll cover it in greater detail in Chapter 3, where we discuss migration. And in doing so, I'm going to introduce the idea of the great of excuse me of the great migration and white flight in relationship to Detroit, Michigan as an example. So on that note, let's get learning. So in the video lecture from chapter 3B on migration, as I said before, we'll kind of discuss the great migration in detail. But for now, what we need to know about the great migration was it was a movement of about 6 million African Americans out of the rural south to the urban northeast, the Midwest, and West that occurred between 1910 and 1970. So the primary push factors for the migration were segregation, increase in racism, the widespread violence of lynching, and a lack of social and economic opportunities in the South. There were also factors that pulled migrants to the North, such as labor shortages in the Northern factories due to World War I, that resulted in thousands of jobs available to African Americans in steel mills, railroads, meat packing plants, and the automobile industry. The pull of jobs in the North was strengthened by the efforts of labor, labor agents sent by the Northern businessmen to recruit Southern workers. So Northern companies offered special incentives to encourage black workers to relocate, including free transportation and low-cost housing. So in 1910, the African American population in Detroit was roughly 9,000, but by 1970, it was roughly 754,000 people. So as I said, in 1940, the population of the African Americans in Detroit had grown from about 9,000 in 1910 to about 167,000, an increase of almost 160,000 African Americans. So the map on the left represents the percentage of whites by census tract in 1940. So the darker the color, the greater the percentage of whites. So for example, the darkest brown areas signify census tracts that have at least a population that is 95% white. The map on the right shows where the population of the black is the greatest, which is downtown Detroit area. You can see the little strip that kind of goes through there. Populations increased so rapidly among African American migrants during the Great Migration that there were housing shortages in most major cities. With fewer resources, African Americans were forced to compete for the oldest, most run-down housing, which is predominantly on the east side of Detroit, Paradise Valley, because this was the only area blacks were allowed to purchase homes. This often led to overcrowding, disease, and um, concentrations of of high poverty levels. The west side neighborhoods around Tyreman and Grand Boulevard, Boulevard was where most many sought to get away from this overcrowding. These families represented more upwardly mobile black families such as ministers, business leaders, and professionals who took great pride in their quote-unquote high-level homes and neighborhoods. Conant Gardens was considered the most exclusive black neighborhood where residents had the highest income and the majority owned their own home. Residents here actually sided with white homeowners in opposing this sojourner truth housing complex because it would bring down their exclusive status. So here we're going to look at this mortgage discrimination and redlining in the inner city areas limiting the newer African American migrants ability to determine their own housing or obtain a fair price. So in this map, we can see where blacks resided. The underlining map shows the various colors representing residential areas on these maps were graded from a scale of A to D, with each ranking denoting by a particular color pertinent to mortgage lending. So we'll kind of go through this here quickly. So the A, or the first grade areas, were colored green and had the federal government's full blessing these were usually new or recently built neighborhoods on the edge of town that were virtually free of African Americans or 
foreign born whites, lenders were encouraged to offer the maximum amount available to the A areas. The next, the second grade, or B areas, were colored blue. These were still good neighborhoods, but beginning to fray around the edges. Here, mortgage lenders were advised to uh, make loans at 10 to 15 percent below the maximum available amount. The third area were colored yellow. These were older neighborhoods with housing styles that might not be, might now be kind of quote unquote out of fashion. Often neighborhood uh, covenants had expired, and of course these are areas where subject to inflation of a lower grade population, quote unquote. So the D neighborhoods were usually struggling for survival. And the, this fourth grade uh, designation granted the struggle would be a losing one, characterized by undesirable populations or infiltration of it, quote unquote. Mortgage lenders would often refuse to make any loans on properties in these neighborhoods. So we can see in these D areas, uh, these red areas, this is where a large percentage of the African Americans lived, so they were not able to buy homes because they couldn't get a mortgage. They wouldn't make lending to these people. So red was the color used to indicate this fourth area. These are areas on the map, and thus a new term came into our vocabulary called redlining. And so redlining is the practice of denying services either directly or through selectively raising prices to residents of certain areas based on their racial or ethnic composition of those areas. So households and businesses in the red zone could not get mortgages or business loans. Note how the blacks, as I said before, are limited to these red areas. And redlining is still something that occurs today. So as Detroit's black population skyrocketed during the Great Migration from the South, the city's whites fought what they called the quote-unquote Negro invasion with every tool at their disposal, which included physical violence and vandalism. When white Detroiters could not win the, the fighting, they fled to the suburbs. Indeed, for a half a century beginning in the 1950s, Detroit lost nearly half of its population, almost all whites. By 1980, we can see a distinct shift in where blacks and whites are living again. So again, in the map on the left, we have the percentage of white people, and we can see that the areas that were once 95% white are now between 1 and 10% white. Conversely, these areas are now 95% or more black. So those who left the city uh, cite various reasons, a desire for a little green space, new housing, better schools, and freedom from crime. Few of them acknowledge the racial motivations behind white flight like words like, quote unquote, freedom from crime were code for moving away for blacks. So black and whites alike wanted to, their own home, to own their own homes and gardens, find better schools for their children, and live on safe streets. But unlike whites, blacks didn't have the freedom to move where they pleased. Detroit had many all-white suburbs with affordable housing, but qualified black homeowners couldn't get mortgages to move there. However, these, black lend these blacks heading outward from the Detroit area moved into all suburbs equally. Rather, they moved into places with older houses, run-down shopping districts, and declining tax revenues. Such towns also typically have poor services and fewer job opportunities than the wealthier suburbs, where, despite strong anti-discrimination laws, it is still hard for blacks to find housing. So this transformation of racial demography seems to reflect the circle of urban change that characterizes several of the processes mentioned here. People care about the urban environment in which they live, and if they are unsatisfied and financially able, they will relocate to neighborhoods that provide better quality of life for them. But often, these relocations leads to a slightly worsening of the environment for others in the neighborhood, leading to a growing uh, uh, flow outward of more affluent residents. So unfortunately in Detroit's history, like that of many other kind of Midwestern cities, most of these preferences have to do with the racial composition of a neighborhood, resulting in out-migration 
that is disproportionately white and affluent. But this process has important consequences. Sustained shifts of pattern of residence that result in increasingly impoverished neighborhoods in the central city lead to declining quality of life and declining tax revenues for the city and other and another round of relocation. So another factors in this concerns schooling in Detroit. So the funding of the Detroit public school system depends on the enrollment enrolled student count. Each year for at least the past 10 years this count has been lower than the prior year. This means that a continuing fiscal crisis for the school and a continuing downward spiral for funding and school population. Parents perceive lower quality as a result of reduced funding. They find alternative schools for their children and the count declines further. But crucially, the quality of school is key determinant for the quality of life of a city and its attractiveness as a destination for young families. So declining school quality reinforces population loss. So here this map is referred to as the racial dot map, which provides a visualization of geographic distribution, population density, and racial diversity of the American people in every neighborhood in the entire country. So this map is focused on Detroit, the area with the red boundary and the surrounding area, where one dot represents one person. So here blacks are denoted in green, while whites are denoted in blue. So as you can see, Detroit is mostly black. And it's not because a significant number of blacks continue to move into Detroit. Rather, it's a result of white flight. So on that note, have a great day and talk to you in the next lecture.